So our next speaker is uh, Hoyt Long, um, who is his co-author Richard Sean Zo. Um, has a paper called Network Science and Literature History, and I think it's about Japanese literature, if I remember yeah. right. Great. Uh, uh, yeah, I've got the mic. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, and to the rest of the committee for inviting us here today. We're really pleased to uh, just have an opportunity to share some of our uh, very uh, beginning stages of some work on a project that uh, tries to apply network analysis techniques to um, the visualization and uh, quantification of poetic networks in Japan, the US, and China. Um, one caveat, I think we're the odd, we might be the odd folks out here in that we are actually humanist and, and trained literary scholars who, to borrow Roger's phase, are, are backing into network science or, or jumping off the cliff into network science. Um, and so uh, our, our project is, is you know, relatively low tech and we're, we're just pleased to have opportunity to share it with folks who can help us um, <coughs> build the, the technical and quantitative dimensions of the work. Of the work. Um, just to begin, a quote from Ezra Pound, just a, a reminder that this, the desire for quantification um, in, even amongst uh, folks in literature is not anything new. Um, he was faced with uh, this collection of poetry, magazines, and periodicals. And he wanted a better way to arrange it. All he had was big boxes <laughs> in which he sorted them, but he was after a kind of a more scientific and accurate and mature arrangement um, as a way to make sense of, of all of this material, of all of this data. Uh, I want to just answer two, two questions for our project. Why network analysis? Um, well, for the, the, the first part is because we think it, it, it can help us isolate certain aspects of the social structure of, of literary networks. Um, and that this can then help us to redirect and deepen uh, our readings of texts. So it's a very, our, 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 our framework is very much a sociological one. Um, in literary studies more generally and also in sociological approaches to literature, there has been a kind of a resistance to empiricism um, despite the desire for it from, from long before. And so we're, we're trying to, in a sense, engage with numbers to see how it might um, open up new questions for the literary archive. There have been a few exceptions, some work that has been done using empirical methods um, in which we draw some inspiration from. Second question is why poetry? Why do we choose this as a test case? Um, the period that we're interested in, which is the, basically the pre-war period, the late teens to the 30s, um, there was this, this boom in little magazines and independent coterie journals, um, which essentially helped to organize poetic activity um, in the modern period. So these journals have an inherently social dimension. They bring together certain types of artists and poets based on their literary styles, their political affiliations, and, and whatnot. Uh, so that's the first reason. The second reason, it's a global phenomenon. These periodicals become kind of a, a, a global literary currency, and so it allows us to think about uh, network, network um, issues in multiple cases and, and transnationally. Um, and also, uh, publication networks through the, in these poetry magazines are fairly easily turned into network data. So essentially, we use the fact of publication as an explicit tie linking a poet to a journal with the idea, with the assumption that submission to a journal has indicates some kind of affiliation, whether positive or negative, with the other people who are submitting to that journal. Um, there are complications, of course, the fact that we're dealing with historical data, so you know, fears about incompleteness, although our, our, the data for the US and Japan is quite good. And also, uh, for humanists, uh, the reduction of dimensionality, that inevitably we have to um, reduce text to uh, to objects, um, certainly not all poems are created equal, and yet we have to essentially treat them as such. Uh, but we're sort of we're aware of aware of these complications as we um, as we move into this kind of work. And essentially, the the network based questions that we have and that we think we can pull out of the data, one is very simple: Do avant garde publication networks do they resemble small world networks? We assume that they probably do, but are they more small worldly at some times than others, or in different places? Um, how do network topologies confirm or contest received uh, categories of literary history uh, and classification? Uh, the, largest, the larger question, you know, how much was journal publication actually a measure of poetic affinity? Can we find some correlations between where authors published and um, something about the nature of the, 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 the poems that they published? 
uh, and did, um, were some public publications able to hold some groups together more tightly than others? And one final question uh, that we've become interested in is, can we identify cases where the network position of a poet correlates with literary reputation or with uh, the known stylic te stylistic tendencies of a poet? So is there some correlation between network uh, structure, structure, position in the network and uh, literary form? Uh, we're particularly interested in brokerage and closure. Uh, so just to give you a sense of the data, uh, it's, it's fairly small scale, um, we're, we're inputting, none of this is digitized, so we have to do this all by hand. Uh, but for the Japan case, the, the index we're working with has about 100,000 entries, 4,000 poets, and 167 journals. And we've selected a subset of that, same with the U.S. case. Uh, and the China's a little bit more difficult, um, but I'm going to show you just one slide just to give you a sense of um, what that network looked like. So there are really two aims of the project. One is just uh, the use of visualization to, as, a, as an exploratory tool for um, basically raising new questions about uh, literary history, for discovering figures who, are not, who have not been uh, canonized, um, and also just for getting a sense of the social dimensions of literary form. Um, and the, when we do the visualization, these, um, even at the level of static images, uh, in some cases, they really confirm what we know, such as that during the, the late teens, the American field of poetry was uh, quite do dominated by certain high modernists um, who gathered around Poetry Magazine there in the center. But that um, about a decade later, the field of modernism uh, broke into a various competing factions, um, namely the, uh, a group called the Fugitives on the upper left and the Harlem Renaissance poets on the on the far right. So the network image certainly confirms some of the things that literary historians already talk about uh, with reference to this period. Uh, we, we have we, similar things, uh, I'm going to skip ahead here just for the sake of time. Um, s s similar things are confirmed in the Japan data. Uh, the China data you can see is radically different, uh, essentially because we've had to, there aren't any good indexes, so we've had to work backward. We've chosen a set of journals and then constructed the data from that. But e even at this provisional stage, we're seeing that it does confirm certain things we know about literary societies in Republican era China, which is that they were highly fractious and that there were few, um, there was very little overlap uh, between them in terms of cooperation and, and brokerage. Here's just um, the, the visualization. So at the same time that they confirm some things, they also uh, raise some new questions, uh, challenging questions for us. One, just a very general sort of differences in network uh, topology and morphology. Um, here you see a comparison of the U.S. data, the Japan data, and the China data. The journals are in yellow, and, and the poets are, are in gray. Um, other questions uh, that it raises um, for us are um, in terms of tracking career trajectories of poets. Oftentimes, we literary historians talk about certain poets as if they belong to a particular field, like the anarchists, the high modernists, the surrealists. And what's interesting for us is to actually to manually you know, color, the, color the nodes according to those categories and then watch how those change over time. So in the 28-29 case uh, for Japan, uh, what we have are, is a pretty clear bifurcation of these groups um, into sort of three sections, uh, but that six years later, um, these colors seem to make less and less sense. There's a lot more mixing and blending. And so this raises some really interesting uh, questions for the literary historian. You know, are the categories that we've been applying, are they correct? Or what is it about this particular period that didn't allow for those categories to, to look like we would expect them to? Um, and then, of course, using the features of the network, we can allow, we can automate the process and let the, you know, let algorithm detect communities for us. Uh, I did this for a, um, a projection of the data. This, these are just the authors uh, seen through, seen through their connections to through journals. Um, and in fact, this this community detection is picking up things that we know about the period, which is that these four poets uh, broke off from. The poets on the left, the, uh, the in the blue, um, and so it's, it's certainly picking that up, but it's also raising certain other questions about why certain figures um, were in 
were placed in particular groups. So, um, and then another thing that we're interested in is, are these uh, figures who seem to span certain structural holes. In the American poet's case, clear, some clear instances are uh, these two poets, Laura Riding and County Cullen, who are lesser known and yet ha seem to have a very important uh, place in the network structure as, uh, as bridges between cliques. Um, uh, of course, visualization is limited. Uh, we know it can only take us so far, so we're uh, also interested in exploring some of these questions through network science, uh, through sort of formalizing our questions into network science problems. Uh, one of the things that we run into initially is that we're dealing with weighted two-mode networks, um, and we want to make sure that we um, are able to, to use the richness of that data, uh, that it matters how many poems somebody contributed to a journal. Uh, and there's been a lot of good work on, on weighted two-mode networks, um, but we wonder, you know, as literary historians, how, how analogous our data is to, for example, Southern women and events <laughs> and, uh, and parties. Uh, is it analogous to a scientific collaboration? Broadway musicals, actor movie networks, where in this, uh, where in this work might um, poetic networks fit? Uh, so we've been using uh, the TNET software package to run some of our models. Uh, just to, I'll, I'll talk about just a few of the, uh, the measures that we're, we're interested in. One is the clustering coefficient. Uh, what's interesting here is that when we run it on the U.S. data, we actually, it actually confirms what we would expect given the poets that we've put in. And that is that after 1922, there is a, uh, a significant decrease um, indicating that there are more clusters that are less connected. And this is something that literary, literary historians and observers at the time clearly recognized, that modernism was fracturing, that something was very different about the field. Um, we're also interested in the question of, of, you know, when we develop these measures, the question of projection. Uh, and this is actually a very humanist question, which is to say, when you want to know the value between two poets through the journals, how do we decide what that value should be? Um, how do we weight that relation? Should it be the sum of the number of times that they published? Uh, should it be equal to the, the minimum uh, between them? So if poet A publishes five and poet B publishes two, should their connection to each other be two? Um, or should it be something yet more complex, which would be something like Newman's method, which uh, would weight them dependent on the total number of contributions to the journal? Uh, we think it's probably closer to something like three. We just don't, we don't have a complete data set yet. So we've been, uh, but we've been sort of playing around with these different projections. And one of the, since one of the measures, one of the features we're interested in is, is betweenness or bridging, you know, to what extent does a poet kind of broker between groups. Uh, we've run between this measures on the projections for the minimums, uh, using the minimums method and the sums method, and uh, sort of put that into a heat map just to get a general sense of who's, who's more between and when. Um, and we noticed some significant disparities uh, between these methods. But also, it's, it's, it's helpful to know that it is, in fact, picking up um, for example, this figure here uh, seems to be a very fairly consistent broker during those periods. And in fact, when we go back and you know, um, dig deeper into what's been written about him, he's often described as a kind of broker-like figure who jumped around between different groups um, and was good at negotiating different cliques of poets. So um, our, hopefully, you know, our long-term goal is really to use these kinds of measures as a way then to jump back into the literary ar archive and rethink some of the categories that we uh, typically apply to uh, literary history. Um, I'll go ahead, um, I'll just leave this slide up. Uh, these are some future directions, future sort of network science questions that we want to begin to ask as our data becomes more uh, rich and complex. Uh, but. Um, I, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and stop here, and we'd love to hear any questions or comments uh, that you might have. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, let, me, let me wrap up a little bit, because I think it's necessary. Uh, so if I understood well, your networks were 
uh, you had poets on one side, yeah. and then you had uh, journal um, or, or, or volumes of publications, and you were looking at the co-occurrence of these people across these volumes. Right. Yeah, and the volumes were actually yeah. basically years of these things. That's right. So, okay. So that's something which is, I think, um, in any network's talk, even if you're among network people, mm -hmm. should be pointed out at the beginning. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, was, yeah I felt rushed for time. But yeah. yeah, we're essentially dealing with weighted by yeah. part type. And graphs, yeah. I, I agree that, so, so basically one thing um, for the rest of the audience who, who, who considers this, like stuff like this a flaw, right? So you have to imagine if you come out of the humanities field and you, you self-learn this kind of stuff, yeah. this is something, if you're not exposed <laughs> to like hundreds of right. networks talks, that's yeah. something which happens. And, uh, but, but a related question, so if you have a bipartite network of, of, of poets and poem volumes, journals, yeah. what except, or journals, yeah. how, how, do, how could you come up with a, with, with, with the concept of brokerage, because it's like, um, you know, um, say James Brown <laughs> did a couple of singles in 1967, and there is a guy who also uh, has a couple of singles in 1967, and James Brown and some other guy uh, published in 1983, and then according to your concept of brokerage, then James Brown would broker between, say, I don't know, Wilson Pickett and, uh, and Michael Jackson. Uh -huh. Um, that yeah. how, how can you, that's not something you can work with, right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, I, just to get at that question, we really think because we're, we're dealing with basically it's the, the poems themselves, the text themselves are our, our, our connectors. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about brokerage as not by the individual himself, but through literary form. So that mm -hmm. if there's a poet who's publishing in the Harlem Renaissance journals mm -hmm. and then also publishing in Poetry Magazine or some of the other mm -hmm. periodicals where there isn't any mutual overlap, mm -hmm. then we our, our question is, does that poet's, does his writing somehow reflect a certain hybridity? Is mm -hmm. he, is he ex in a sense, spanning a certain um, stylistic gap in the Like field? bridging genres yeah. or something. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Exactly. Um, we actually are, uh, we, have, we have two more minutes for discussion, so um, open for questions. Alexander Miller from Goethe University. Um, but I would like to continue that question. But would then this mean that you would need to look much more into the documents themselves mm -hmm. before yeah. you can state there is, that there is a stylistic relation between yeah, those that's documents? Right. Yeah. yeah. So that, and that's ultimately, we're, we're, we're thinking about this as a as network analysis, a kind of uh, a tool for discovery. So that it's by identifying these features that we couldn't see just by looking we can't read an index to poetry, we can't read all the poems, but the question is, so we identify these figures, then we go and look at their poetry, and sometimes their position may correlate to something stylistically, sometimes it may not. But without this sort of 10,000 foot view, we can't even, these figures wouldn't even pop up, or they wouldn't even register uh, for folks. So that's really our, our goal. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.